guys, welcome back. This is part two on writing a formal lab report. If you have not seen the first part of this video where we cover a general sense of formal lab reports, including title page, abstract, and introduction with chemical index, then go and check that out. This is the second video in the two-part series for writing formal lab reports. So we're gonna pick up right where we left off. Um, this study guide will be left as a link down in the description along with a link to the first half of this uh, video series, which I would strongly encourage you to go check out if you haven't seen that part already. So moving on with methods and materials. Um, the methods and materials section should be one of the easiest for you to write because you are really just reiterating what you went through when you did your actual procedure in lab. This is also a pretty easy section to write because it doesn't have to be brand new. In other words, you're not creating the content so much as you are able to take what is in the lab book or the handout or whatever procedure you had, and you can basically surmise it in your own words. Um, some professors will let you just reference the lab book, and if that's the case, you can just reference, you know, see lab book, whatever, pages, this to that. Um, this section should be as detailed as needed, but should avoid any, and I put this here, flowery language, excessive use of adjectives and adverbs, and any unneeded statements. So for instance, saying the reaction took longer than expected. You don't need to state that. All you need to state is how long the reaction actually took. Um, you can provide insights in your discussion section. That's what it's for. The discussion is to discuss the data so that you have an opportunity to give insights into what's, uh, you know, what's present in your data. This section should be very cut, dry, and boring. Imagine you're writing a recipe, right? So if you think about a recipe, it says two cups of flour added to one cup of sugar or something like that. It's very cut, dry, and to the point. So it's also important to avoid a couple of things here. And we're going to, at the end, sort of talk about a few things you really want to avoid. But you'll see that throughout this, the rest of this uh, series here. So it's very important to avoid first-person narrative. I, we, our. You also want to avoid you, um, things like that, like you're talking to the individual. Um, a common solution that students will use, now you have to be careful with this, a lot of students will replace I with the student or the experimenter. And this is considered an unprofessional way to attempt to write lab reports, okay? You simply state what happened. So uh, I have some examples down here that we'll look at, but you would not say I added five grams of benzoic acid. You would not say the student or the experimenter added five grams of benzoic acid to the flask. You would simply state, five grams of benzoic acid were added to the flask. That's all you need to state. Okay. Um, simply state what happened, not who performed the action. All methods should be written in the past tense. A lot of people forget this. Okay, So it's not, you know, a melting point is then taken. It's a melting point was taken. It's past tense when you're working with this. Um, and it should be devoid of all opinions. You're not going to give your opinion whether you think a reaction was long, whether um, you know, there was a potential error. You can discuss that somewhat in the discussion section. Finally, make sure to use proper terminology. So you would talk about a compound melting, not a compound liquefying. That's not the proper term. So you need to make sure you're using scientific terms. That also includes getting away from things like things. I could just, you know, I just use that word. Um, but stuff, um, item, all of those terms should be more specific when you're writing a lab report. You don't say uh, the stuff, right? It's the compound at the bare minimum, and that compound usually has a specific identity, unless maybe it's an unknown compound. So this is a formal lab report, right? We're not having a open, informal conversation with one another where we could use slang and words like stuff uh, or thing or something like that. So examples, I gave a couple of examples here with a bad form and a good form when you're trying to do this. So for the examples, let's take a look at some of these. Number one, it would be bad form to say, I added five milliliters of ethanol to the 500 milligrams of benzoic acid I weighed out. Good form would be to state a 500 milligram sample of benzoic acid was mixed with five milliliters of ethanol. Notice it takes out the first person and any of those sort of um, personalized descriptors. You really are just giving the facts of what happened. So number two with bad form. Uh, 
the uh, I should I need to fix that. It should be the uh, reaction or no the distillation is run for 45 minutes before the product will be collected for filtration. So good form that's bad form because it's in the present tense or the future tense if you're talking about is right. So good form is to say the distillation was run for 45 minutes before the product was collected by filtration. All right, bad form. The reaction went 15 minutes longer than expect than the expected 30 minutes. Good form. The reaction ran for a total of 45 minutes. You don't need to tell people that it ran for an extra length of time. You simply need to tell people that it ran for 45 minutes. Okay, bad form. The extraction produced an excessively oily-like layer at the top of the separatory funnel for a very long time. That is getting too wordy and too descriptive. Good form. The extraction produced an oil layer at the top of the separatory funnel. They don't need to know that it was there for a very long time. Okay, avoid terms like very, um, the, where it says excessively oily-like. You can just say oily. You don't need to state that, okay? You don't want extra decorative words that are sort of describing these uh, methods. All right, so that pretty much wraps up methods and materials. Data and results. This is going to be surprisingly short when we discuss this section, although it can be fairly heavy in terms of the amount of work you have to put in. So this section should be short on words and heavy on data. Hence, that's why it's going to be short, because it's going to depend on your data itself. It's not really discussing talking about anything. All right. So very short on words. If you write a data and results section and you see you're starting to put in paragraphs, sentences at the most, and even then you're really looking at just providing the data. Okay. Data should be placed into table format, sort of like the chemical index we saw, but now it should have data values based on your observations and what you collected. All right. Calculations should be presented here with all work shown. Data should be included uh, or could include yields, so theoretical yields, you need to show calculations with limiting reactants, actual yields and percent yields, melting points, both your observed melting point and the literature melting point, and additionally, if you have any spectra such as IR, NMR, mass spec, GCs, anything of that nature, uh, where you have sort of graphical representations that are being analyzed, they should be included as well. Save all the writing and the critical analysis for the discussion section. You should not be going into any details here. You should simply be showing the results. At this point, the reader does not care whether they're significant or not, whether they are off or not, and there might be an error. That's for the discussion, all right? So now the discussion. Hopefully that was clear for the results section. It should be in table format. So, you know, table two, um, observed melting points, table three, and something about tables I want to mention here. This is part of good form. Tables should never break onto another page. You should not have a table that starts at the bottom of one page, breaks, and then continues on another page. That is very, very poor form when you're attempting to do a formal lab report. Anything that you have to put on a table, you need to make sure it can fit within the context of that page. If not, if you're having issues with it, then you need to place it on a separate page so that it has its own page. But you should not split tables apart where table two starts at the bottom and then it continues you know, through the next page where it's a split like that. Um, all right, so on to the discussion because that was just a, a, something I wanted to mention about tables there. And by the way, figures, if you have to give a diagram or show a reaction or something like that, figures are labeled at the bottom. Tables are labeled at the top. And figures underneath the figure, you would write figure one and then state what, you know, figure one represents. All right, discussion. This section is the critical part of your formal lab report. And I'm going to stress that and emphasize that. You will always, or you should always, see instructors placing a heavy emphasis when grading this part of the lab. Instructors usually give a lot of heavy weight to the discussion. And that's for a reason. That's where your insight and analysis you still don't use first person, but your insight and analysis and your, um, you know, basically your conclusions is what it's going to lead to that you draw based on the data present. This is where all of that comes to fruition. So this section is meant for you to go into detail about your results. Many students fall short in their discussion because they simply restate the results. 
but they do not properly analyze their meaning or tie the results back into the theory and background of the experiment at hand. Reese, I'm going to say this with a lot of emphasis because this is important. Restating your results and doing nothing else is not a good idea, especially since this information is already available to the reader in the previous section, right? So to turn around and in the results section and the data section to give me a table with the observed melting points, the literature melting points, you know, the theoretical yields, the actual yields, and then for me to come down, I, I gather that information, right? I gleam over the tables. For me to come down to the discussion and for you to say the observed melting point of benzoic acid was 122 degrees Celsius. This matches with the literature point. Therefore, benzoic acid was pure. And that's all you say? You need to be discussing that to a greater extent because I could have gathered that from maybe not the, the purity part if I'm a real novice, but I could at least gather the fact that the benzoic acid melted at 122 and that's what the literature value said it should have melted at, okay? So let's take a look at what a proper discussion really should be going into detail about because a lot of students say, well, what do I do? What do I talk about? Uh, you know, if I restate my results, what else is there to really discuss? I'm just telling you the results. Okay, so what is there to discuss? Well, there's a list here. You should restate the purpose briefly, right? If the reader gets to this point, remind the reader with a sentence or two what the purpose of the experiment was before you're about to dive into all of the data and get into some heavy analysis. It is okay to summarize the results. So I was kind of down on that at first when I was up there. However, it is appropriate to summarize the results and state them, but it shouldn't end there. That's what's sort of the, the slap in the face to the reader. So referring to specific tables and figures found in the data is also helpful here. So, um, you know, as seen in table two, the melting point of compound X was found, to, was observed to be, you know, and then you can state the value. Um, so here's the important part. To discuss whether the observed results were what you expected and make comparisons to known values. In other words, the literature values when possible. So was this the expected result? A lot of times you're gonna have results that may vary somewhat from the expected result and you should be discussing that, okay? Tie observed results back in with theory and background involved in the lab. A lot of the times that's found in the introduction section. So again, if you had uh, benzoic acid. It was supposed to melt at 122 degrees Celsius, but you find that it melts at 110 degrees Celsius. Why did it melt at a lower temperature range? Tie that back into the fact that there must be impurities present, and therefore those must be interrupting the intermolecular forces that benzoic acid would have with itself, and that is what's probably leading to the depression in the melting point that's being observed. So talk about the theory, tie it back into the theory at large. Discuss any potential sources of error. Now, I note here, do not make up these sources unless they may be plausible. So what do I mean by that? You could potentially talk about a source of error um, being that you know your thermometer uh, is off slightly in terms of the calibration or something. But you shouldn't turn around and say, human error is a potential source of error. You need to get more specific than that because human error could be something like knocking a flask over on the table and I lose some of my compound, okay? If that's your human error, that either happened or it didn't. And you should know whether that happened or it didn't. So that's not a potential error unless it actually happened. You should be physically and mentally aware that you knocked over some of your compound or you saw some of your compound. A lot of students, right, when they're they're getting ready to transfer solid compound into a filter to do a filtration, they'll say some of the compound may have been lost during filtration. Well, was it or was it not? You should be able to see if there was a substantial amount that you couldn't get into the filter. And if that's the case, you should have been working harder to get that into the filter. You shouldn't have just left it there, okay? And then finally, you should try to connect data points to one another. So if you have more than one data point, um, you know, you took multiple melting points or something like that, attempt to connect them together. Why did one compound have a lower melting point than another? Uh, is it that the one with the higher melting point had hydrogen bonding, so it had stronger intermolecular forces? Start to do some analysis like that, all right? So as a general rule, almost all discussions need a minimum of two paragraphs, minimum if you're attempting to discuss something. Because one paragraph alone can take up the 
restatement of the objectives and then can also state the data and the results back again. And that's one paragraph alone. And we said that was kind of the cop out. Then you need to at least do some discussion. So more often, you're going to be looking at at least three paragraphs, sometimes four, okay, for a good discussion. Um, probably one page would be minimum for a discussion in double spaced. I would say two, potentially two and a half. Um, it is possible you could overkill the discussion. You can write too much, but it should be somewhere in between there, okay? Uh, so remember, you are supposed to be discussing and analyzing data, not just stating it. So all discussion sections should be brought to an end leading into a conclusion for the experiment that was performed. Okay, so then the conclusion. A conclusion is brief and to the point. It should reveal any crucial results and what information can be concluded from the data observed. This can oftentimes be even a single sentence. You don't always have to have a paragraph for this, but it should never surpass one paragraph in an undergraduate lab. Kind of like the abstract, the conclusion, it's like, okay, let's get to the point, right? What do, what do we need to take away from this? You shouldn't be going on and on like you would in the discussion. And then finally, the references here, okay? So in short, have them. You need to have references. So I'm going to read through this just so people are on the same page as we're talking about this. You can reference your lab book, meaning the actual, whether you had a handout, a lab book, whatever it was that gave you your procedure. But you really need to be accessing additional sources. So keep in mind that Wikipedia and other open source projects of information are not considered acceptable references. And that's because anybody could change that material. So I could go into Wikipedia right now and I could go to the benzoic acid page and I could turn around and edit the melting point and say that it's 250 degrees Celsius. And if you happen to be writing your lab report and before somebody catches that and changes it back, you could get the wrong data and you could put it down because it's open source. Anybody can edit it. So Wikipedia can be a good starting point where you can find, because many Wikipedia articles have references to more legitimate sources down in the bottom of the Wikipedia article. And so that's a great sort of lead to additional sources. But I would strongly encourage you against citing Wikipedia. It is not considered scientifically um, an acceptable standard, so to speak, when you're doing that. But I do know it comes up a lot, and that's where most people tend to, to grab their info. Um, Usually the information found on these sites can be valid, meaning like the open source sites, um, but since they are open to editing, they cannot be taken as credible. So check with your specific instructor as to how they would like references to be cited. Some instructors want, you know, proper MLA or APA or all those different formats. Some people say as long as you've referenced it and you've given credit. Um, online ones, you need to have the date that you actually accessed it along with the URL and things of that nature, okay? So make sure you have references, and that brings us to a close. So just as a reminder, I'm going to leave this study guide on writing formal lab reports down as a link in the description, okay? I also have links to my social media pages, so if you're interested in getting all the up-to-date material, um, you can follow us either on Twitter or on Facebook, and we will certainly be releasing more YouTube content here shortly. So if you hit the subscribe button, it certainly helps the channel out and you will be up to date anytime there's a new release from the channel. Uh, we have very exciting things that are in the works. I'm gonna be attempting to do some online office hours at some point um, for anybody that might have questions. Um, we'll probably have certain themes just so it doesn't get like too out of control. Um, but I'll try to do maybe like a Google Hangouts or even a, a live YouTube stream or something like that. Uh, where people can ask questions. So I've got some more content on the horizon that I'm going to put out there. Um, hopefully you guys find this lecture series helpful for writing formal lab reports, and I would be happy to answer questions or go into more detail. Please, um, if you enjoyed the video, like it, because that helps. And if you leave comments, I will be happy to get back to you. So other than that, thank you very much for spending time learning with us, and I will see you guys for the next lesson. Take care.